Did you know that God never intended for the Gentiles to be under the Old Testament law? That's a strong statement, but it's absolutely true. It's scripture. We're going to talk about that today, so stay tuned for the gospel truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing my series talking about the true nature of God, and this week is going to be the end of this teaching. Now I'm going to go on and teach something I think that's very complimentary. It'll be another, uh, you know, expansion uh, of this, but we're going to end our teaching on the true nature of God on this Friday. And I've got some brand new teaching that I put out on this. It's actually the same teaching, but it's new and improved and expanded. And uh, so I encourage you to go to the effort of requesting this material. Friday's going to be our last day to offer that to you. I've already covered a lot. If you've missed any of this, you need to get these materials. And even if you've seen this, you need to get these materials because uh, you need to hear this more than once. You need to have it so you could share it with someone else. So please take advantage of that teaching. Let me just share a couple of scriptures with you. We've been talking about how that God is a good God and that it is not really the nature of God to punish and to hate us for our sin. Now by me just saying that, there's going to be some people who get very upset because they say, well, what about this? What about God when he did this and struck people with leprosy and said, if you do this, I'm going to curse you with the curse and on and on. Every example that you can see like that is in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. And one of the points that I've been making, Romans 5.13 says, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. The Lord didn't impute people's sins against them until the time of Moses. And then the law only functioned from the time of Moses until the time of Christ, and then the law ceased. We are not living under the law. So it's been approximately 6,000 years since the fall of Adam. The first 2,000 years, God wasn't imputing man's sins unto them. Then there was a 2,000-year segment where the law did rule and God did impute men's sins unto them. And then there's been another 2,000 years where God has not imputed their sins unto them. God is not a God of vengeance and wrath. Now, He has those things, but He reserves His wrath for His enemies. And He was willing to operate in mercy towards the human race, and that's the reason that He didn't give the law immediately. The only reason he added the law, and some of this is a paraphrase from Galatians chapter 3, the law was added because of our transgressions to shut us up until the Savior could come and bring redemption. The Lord never really wanted to impute man's sins unto them. He wanted to impute our sins unto his Son. But before Jesus could come, sin was multiplying and infecting the human race at such a rate that the Lord's plan would have been thwarted. It never would have come to pass if God hadn't have done something to limit the spread of sin. So, he used fear of punishment, fear of the wrath of God to literally scare the devil out of people. And it limited the amount of sin that they committed, but the sin they had committed began to start dominating them and destroying them. You know, I could spend a lot of time explaining this. Let me just try and illustrate this real quickly uh, by my own personal life. I was raised in a Christian home. We were very religious. And, uh, I mean, we didn't mow the grass on a Sunday because that was work. You didn't do any kind of work on Sunday. Uh, you know, we, we were pretty strict. And I was probably more strict than anybody else. My brother and sister grew up in the same home, and yet it didn't seem to affect them the way it did me. They kind of got off the rails for a while. But for whatever reason, I just took it to heart, and I was super, super, super strict. I believe I had to live holy or God was going to get me. And as a result, you know, I'm 57 years old. I've never taken a drink of liquor. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never used profanity in all of my life. And so, you know what? That started me out on the right track, and it kept me from experimenting and doing some of the things that other people had done. Some people would think, well, that's wonderful. But here's some of the negative effects. 
I was doing that not out of love for the Lord, gratitude for what he had done for me, but I did it out of fear of the Lord, fear that I was going to be punished and rejected if I didn't. And to prove it, like when I was a kid, I used to have reoccurring nightmares at least once or twice a year, about every six months or so. I would have a nightmare that I had smoked a cigarette, I got caught, they turned me into the police, and the police turned me over to my mother, which was worse than the police. <laughs> and then I actually wound up in this dream in hell, burning in hell because I'd smoked a cigarette. Now, I know some of you are laughing at that and thinking, man, how ridiculous. But, you know, that's what religion does. It put enough fear in me that I never smoked a cigarette. But at the same time, I was probably more guilt-ridden and feeling more unworthy than many of you who not only smoked cigarettes, but you might have smoked dope, you probably had sexual immorality, did all kinds of things that I never did, and you probably never felt as condemned and guilt-ridden as I did. I used to see where they had, you know, sc uh, scratched profanity on the stalls in a public bathroom someplace, and I'd get condemned over that for a week. It'd take me a week to feel like God had forgiven me for reading it. <laughs> And I know some of you are thinking, man, you were one messed up kid. Well, I was because of religion. See, this is what I'm saying. Religion, when you put fear in people that if you do this, boy, you're going to be judged. It may gain compliance, but you are going to be more guilt-ridden over the failures that you do have, and all of us have failures. I may not have gone out and smoked a cigarette and drank and done those things, but you know what? I sinned. I fell short. I did things that were wrong, and when I did, all of this condemnation came crashing in on me, and it was destructive. That's the reason that the Lord didn't want to give the law in the beginning. He could have told Adam and Eve about how sinful they were, but he waited because he didn't want Adam and Eve to know how bad they were. He didn't want them to know how they had plunged the human race into such, I mean, decadence that it was going to cost billions of lives. God didn't want them to know all of that. They couldn't have handled it. God was willing to love them, independent of their performance. But because he wasn't punishing sin and he wasn't venting his wrath upon sin, people begin to compare themselves and think, well, Cain got by with murder, Lamech got by with murder, and they just begin to murder with impunity. It didn't matter. Because God hadn't punished anybody, they thought it was okay. They begin to live in sexual immorality. I mean, perversion of all kinds. And so eventually God had to give the law to restrain the amount of sin, even though it was going to have this side effect that was very damaging. All of the guilt and the condemnation that came with the law is damaging to a healthy relationship with God. It's damaging to our proper understanding of who God is. It really was a misrepresentation. God didn't want to hold our sins against us and punish us the way that it was demonstrated under the Old Testament law. If he had, he could have given the law to Adam and Eve. He restrained himself for 2,000 years because his nature is love. 1 John 4, 8, God is love. He doesn't just possess love. It's not just a one of the things about God. That is the core nature of God. God loves us, and God was never wanting to impute our sins unto us. He was wanting to impute our sins unto his Son. But before his son could get here, there had to be a restraint placed upon sin or there wouldn't have been a virgin left for Jesus to have been born through. And so God gave the law, but it was not his true nature. It wasn't his first choice. It was a, something that he, in a sense, was forced into. Those of you that have been parents know kind of what this is like. We have a uh, some way of relating to this, that you love your kids, you don't want to do anything, but you've told them that they can't do this, this, and this. And eventually, if you don't restrain them, they're going to go out there and get themselves killed or somebody else killed or ruin their life. And sometimes you warn your kids and say, now don't do this. If you do this, I'm going to have to do this. You don't want to punish them. You don't want to restrict them. But they can push you to a place where honestly, for their own good, you have to do something. When you spank your child, if you do it properly, you aren't doing it because you're angry at them, but you're doing it because you love them. And this minor hurt is going to help them to resist something that could eventually hurt them much, much worse. And so, you know, you've heard parents say this before, that this spanking is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. 
And the kid always goes, yeah, right. But the truth is, if you really love them the way that God loves us, it's true. God never wanted to vent his wrath and introduce the law and impute and hold our sins against us. That wasn't his original intent. He had to do that as a secondary step because sin had multiplied. But it was only until Jesus came. Let me share some scriptures on this with you. In Matthew chapter 11, in verse 12, it's, this is Jesus speaking, and he said, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the law, for excuse me, all of the prophets and the law prophesied until John. This is talking about until John the Baptist. Now, if words mean anything, which they do, Jesus said that the law and the prophets were until John the Baptist. That's implying that since John the Baptist, which we are 2,000 years after the time of John the Baptist, the law and the prophets aren't for us today. Here's another verse that goes right along with that out of John chapter 1 in verse 17. It says, um, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That makes it very clear that the law was given by Moses, but... Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The law was given until the time of Christ. And now that Christ has come, Christ has put in grace and truth. Let me give you another example of this out of the book of Galatians. I've already referred to some of these passages. But in Galatians chapter 3, in verse 22, it says, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be unto them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Before faith came, before faith in Jesus came, we were under the law. So I was reading out of Galatians chapter 3 where it says, But uh, the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be unto them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. This scripture says that the law was only until the seed should come to whom the promises were made. And in uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, it says that that seed was Christ. There's also another verse right here that goes right along with this. Uh, in verse 19, it says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And that's talking about Jesus. All of these scriptures are saying that the law was only temporary. It was only until Jesus. So we've already shown from Romans 5.13 that the law was added. It was not his first way of dealing with people. He dealt with people in innocency, not imputing their sins unto him for the first 2,000 years. Then the law was given for a period of about 2,000 years. And it was only until Jesus should come. And now that Jesus has come, God is once again not dealing with us according to the law. He's not imputing our sins unto us. The law was only temporary. Let me go on and read some more verses on that that say this same thing. In verse uh, 23 again, it says, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Man, how can we miss this? The law was like a schoolmaster to train us until Christ should come. Now that Christ has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. We are no longer under the law. That's exactly what this is saying. I've already used scriptures in Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 8 and 9 that talked about that the law was only temporary. Now it's ready to pass away. There is verily a disannulling, which means a complete destruction of the law. Romans chapter 3 verse 19 says that the law was only given to those who were under it, implying that not everybody was under the law. The law wasn't intended for the Gentiles in the first place. Now, the reason all of this is significant is because, again, all of the misrepresentation, all of the confusion about what God is like comes from the law. 
Because under the law, God revealed a harshness and a wrath from him that was not uh, released before the law nor after the law. And so it's just this 2,000 year period of time that God dealt with people under the law that has given this impression that God is a God that wants to just wipe out every sinner. And that really was a misunderstanding of why he did it. He didn't do it because he truly hated the sinner. He truly hated sin and he just was using fear of punishment as a motivation to get us to quit yielding ourselves to sin and the author of that sin, the devil. And in the process, it gave some wrong impressions. You know, I'm sure that there are children that have been corrected incorrectly and that parents have used uh, discipline to vent their own frustrations and certainly there's child abuse and I'm not saying that that doesn't happen. But there are a huge amount of parents that corrected their children because they truly love their child and they are trying to treat them in the right way. But you know the day and age that we live in today, everything is so misconstrued. Matter of fact, this is one of the signs of the end time. I believe it was Isaiah chapter 5 that says in the end times they'll call those things which are good evil and evil good. That's one of the signs of the last time. And we live in that. And you know what? There are kids today that feel like that they've been abused by their parents and their parents hated them and all of these things. And the truth is, the parents love them and they just misunderstood it and misapplied it. You know, if uh, you were to apply things that they call child abuse today back to 50 years ago, I guarantee when I was raised up, I, I could have called uh, 911 on my parents if they would have had 911 back then. And... Uh, Parents would have been locked in jail and thrown away. And yet I guarantee you, I know my parents corrected me because they love me. And there's times that they even did it in anger, which wasn't probably the best way. But I had ticked them off and they were angry, but they did it because they loved me. And it wasn't child abuse. They were doing it to help me. And you know what? I learned some things through it. I tell you, we're so touchy-feely and so far off base in what is right and wrong today, it's not even funny. But I'm saying that Children, in the same way that children have been lied to, that if your parent ever spanked you, that's because they didn't love you. That's not true. It's because they did love you that they spanked you. But if you tell a person that long enough, you know, you can get them to where they see all of these things as child abuse and they hate people. Well, we have been mis... God has been misrepresented. And people have taken the Old Testament law where God did discipline people, I mean harshly, and they have used this to misrepresent what God is really like. And it's significant to me when you look at 6,000 years of human history and you find out that 4,000 of those 6,000 years, God was not imputing their sins unto them. He has been gracious unto them. And then you understand why he gave the law and it was actually an act of mercy that he gave that harshness and that discipline even then. It was to restrain the amount of sin and to take this deception of self-righteousness away from us so that we would despair of self-salvation and throw ourselves on the mercy of God. If you understand these things properly, I believe what it does is give you a different picture of who God is of what his real nature is. And that's the reason that I'm bringing all of these things out. These are things that God used to help me. Man, it's powerful. You know, I've heard people before go back and say, well, God, when it says that God did things in the Old Testament and that God struck this person with leprosy and that God killed this person and he killed David's child from an adulterous marriage and things like this. I've had people in an attempt to represent God as a loving God say, that's mistranslated, that God didn't actually cause that, he allowed it. It's in the permissive sense instead of the causative sense. And I understand the point that they're trying to make. I understand that they're trying to say that under the day we live under that God isn't striking your children. It's not God that put the cancer on people. It's not God that caused your marriage to fail, your business to fail. And I agree with the point that they're trying to get across. But you know what? As I've studied Scripture, I just don't believe that that's what the Scripture is saying. It's not just that God allowed it that these things happen. Like I heard a man say even one time that God didn't destroy the earth with a flood. 
that he just said that the earth spews out the inhabitants thereof. And so he was saying that it was the earth revolting at the amount of sin. And it was the earth that basically revolted and all of this flood came and these things happened. It was just a natural consequence of sin, but it wasn't divine intervention. But you know, the person, even though I would agree with where they're trying to go, and that is that God isn't the one that puts tragedy in our life. I disagree with that because the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, it says, I, even I the Lord, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. The Lord made it very clear that this wasn't natural results. It was divine intervention. And so somebody says right there, well, then that shows that God is a ticked off angry God. Nope. That, that was an exception, and I've already explained this. I won't go back through all of that. But the way I look at this is all of those things were under the law. Those things weren't blessings. They weren't given to help us. It was a curse. It was the judgment of God. And the Bible says right here in Galatians chapter 3, in the same context as I was just reading, it says in verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. And so somebody says, So you, uh, do you believe that God is the one that struck Uzziah with leprosy? Yes, I do. Well, then that proves that what you're saying, God is imputing our sins unto us. No, that proves that there was a period of time under the law where God imputed man's sins unto them, but I'm not under that. That wasn't a blessing on Uzziah. It was a curse, and Christ redeemed me from the curse of the law. Well, do you believe that God is the one that struck David's child dead? Yes, because the Bible says that he did. Well, then that proves that God is this angry God. No, that was under the Old Testament law where God was judging and imputing man's sins unto them. And I've been redeemed from the curse of the law. Well, do you believe Deuteronomy 28 that if you do these things, instead of the blessings, you're going to get all of these curses, the bots, the mildew, the emrods, and all of these things? Yes, I believe that the Bible said that. But you know what? All of those things were part of the curse of the law. And Christ hath redeemed me from the curse of the law. I am not under the law. Christ has redeemed me. So all of the curses are gone and now the blessings come upon me by faith, not based on my performance. I can take all of the harshness and the wrath and the punishment of God and I can attribute it to the Old Covenant, all of the things that have happened in the past, to the Old Covenant. There is going to be a future time of God pouring out His wrath when the second return of the Lord comes, and He's going to judge His enemies. He's not going to judge His people. The wrath of God will never come upon His people. But right now, we're living in a church age where God is not giving people what they deserve. Since the time of John, the kingdom of heaven is preached, and the law and the prophets were until John, but since that time now we're living in a day of grace and God is not imputing man's sins unto them. Yes, I can see things in the Bible where that shows a harshness and a wrath of God, but I can say, thank God for Jesus. He bore my sin. I'm redeemed from that wrath. I'm redeemed from the curse of me receiving curses instead of blessings because I've failed. And I am living in a day of mercy and grace, and that's good news.